I've been teaching Indian cookery for many years now, and it's always been my aim to lift the veil on ancient Indian curry making formulas so that you can get from front door to curry in just three spices. Because I want you to realise that Indian cookery is not about a long, complicated list of ingredients that we have to crush and grind before we can start cooking. It's not about desperately clinging to a recipe. I want you to be as confident with curry as you are with spaghetti bolognese. And at the heart of this curry confidence is understanding six spices. Every Indian cook will have a similar palette of spices and they will know their spices as well as they know their social group. They'll know who gets on with who, which ones turn bitter when the heat's turned on, which ones are utterly reliable and I want to get you to that place. But today I promised you three spices and we're going to cook with turmeric, chilli and cumin seeds. I've got some potatoes, I've always got potatoes in the house. Um, a bit of red pepper from yesterday, a very sad, limp carrot that I'm hoping to rejuvenate, and some beans that are beginning to turn brown. But trust me, these will be reincarnated in this curry in a matter of minutes. We would never put raw spices into an Indian dish. We have to treat them properly, and that is by dropping them into hot oil so that the hot oil releases the aromatic oils within these seeds. If you were to smell that as it is, cumin seeds are a little bit musty, smell a bit of tomcat almost, no good. But once you drop them into oil and they start to crackle, they transform and they begin to release a nutty citrus flavour. As those are crackling, I'm going to drop a touch of chilli in. Now this is important, chilli does not go into curries to make curries hot. Chilli goes into curries because what you can't smell there is a wonderful meaty smell. Nutty, roasted, smoked, meaty smell and it is giving flavour before it's giving heat. I'm talking about two teaspoons or three teaspoons of tinned tomatoes into the curry and what that's going to do is caramelise and bubble back up through the dish. The tomatoes go to the bottom, the oil works its way through the tomatoes. At the moment the tomatoes are very red and very frank. We need to wait for those to go slightly oily and brown. And we have a phrase in Indian that you have to wait for the oil to come out of the tomatoes, almost as though the oils in the tomatoes themselves are released when they're cooked. So we could have it as a very tomato -y curry. You could put a lot more tin tomatoes in. You could avoid the tomatoes altogether and just go for the mustard and make it a really zingy, zesty curry. There is something synergistic about adding both. That's my palate. I always love adding both tomato and uh, mustard paste. I find it hard to resist that combination. Try it. This is where you can experiment. This is where you get to the stage where you own your spices and you own your armory. One of the other things you can add towards the closing stages of any curry is a little bit of yoghurt. It's going to make it slightly creamier and it's going to tame the flavours. One final percolation of those flavours and they're married together properly and our curry is ready to eat. So as I promised you, it's three spices, any bits of vegetable that you have in the house, a few minutes, and you have the most authentic, richly perfumed, delicious Indian vegetable curry. It's real alchemy. There's an awful lot that goes on in the pan without you even doing anything. And once you know how to treat your spices and you understand the chemistry of what you're doing, it really does release you into being really quite brave and artistic with your curry. So I'm just going to wait for this chicken to seal. And then we're going to go in two different directions. I'll set two pans up for you and get them going as quickly as possible. Okay, our chicken is beginning to turn brown. So, I'm going to divide this pan into half. We'll cook half later. Put half into this pan. Let's turn one creamy and let's turn one brown and tomatoey and rich. At this stage, instead of going the creme fraiche yoghurt route, we go the tomato route. If I was to serve this curry very shortly after I put tomatoes in, all you would taste is this watery tomato in this. That's not what we want. We want those tomatoes to very much disappear into the background, but give their best to this curry. And in giving their best, they're giving brownness, a little bit of tanginess, a little bit of sweetness, and a beautiful, rich colour. I'm going to think about adding some vegetables to this now. 
I've got a green pepper. Let's turn it into a bit of a jal frazy today. Very simple. They take seconds to cook. Just chop them into the kind of bite-sized pieces that you would want. Throw them in. They're going to be done in seconds. You could go mad and put a bit of red pepper in. Make it a bit more visually stimulating. Let's try that. Now, of course, you could put courgette, you could put broccoli in here. Nothing is going to go amiss. There are no rules. Every Indian cook will cook their curries a little bit differently. And this is where you can be the artist. This jar frazi has had about 15 minutes now. Small pieces of chicken breast. I can see that they're perfectly cooked through. They're tender. I'm calling that dish done. I always like to finish my curries with a little bit, if I can, of fresh coriander. It doesn't matter if you don't have any in. Don't let that put you off cooking it. We always add coriander at the end because it's not heat tolerant. It's unstable in heat, its flavours disappear. But what coriander does is it gives a lovely fresh greenness to the dish. It's a lovely finishing flavour. And there we have our jar frazi. Now let's see how our chicken korma's doing. I've got some creme fraiche here. It's a kind of perfect blend. Yogurt can make it a bit tart. Creme fraiche gives it that little bit of a sour note, um, but it's still quite a gentle addition. So we just throw a bit of creme fraiche in, just enough to cover the meat because you're going to pad this sauce out with water. I don't want a heavy cloying artery filling sauce. I want it light but rich. So we're covering the meat with the creme fraiche. It's calming that pan down quite nicely. I could keep this quite light. I could avoid putting any other heavy ingredients in. But I'm going to put in some ground almonds. It gives it a body and it's just a little bit more hedonistic. If I had guests coming over, this is the kind of thing I'd do. If I was sitting on my own with a fork, I wouldn't bother because of the calories. That's been bubbling away. And it's got that reassuring korma, cashmere yellow to it. Let's give it a final blast. That's ready to transfer to a bowl. It's ready to eat. There we go. Now, depending on what you will have added to that, you could have added vegetables, you could have added lots of different kinds of fruit or one or two accent fruits. But it's certainly going to be as tantalising in the mouth as that is on the eye. What I'm going to ask you to do is just toss those grains into that oil and you'll see that they turn slightly glossy and the spices, the mustard seed, are nicely intermingled amongst them. So just toss it round. And what happens then is when we add the water, the rice grains remain a little bit individual because they're, they're coated in this protective oil film. And it gives fried rice a slightly different texture to boiled rice. Boiled rice is kind of like a cloying, comforting, starchy sofa, whereas the fried rice is a bit more of an interesting, elegant dish with a bit more of a bite to it. We've put the lid on the fried rice, we've switched the gas off, we're leaving it to cook. Now let's see how our boiled rice has fared. That looks like perfection to me. You can tell when the grains almost stand to attention. And it's cooked itself, put a lid on about five minutes ago and switched the gas off. Now we just need to await the fried rice. That's ready to serve. Let's get a plate and a few spoons and that could be the body of a real free-for-all.